In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> the readings assigned for the day sometimes speak to the life of the world in a way that uh, you don't always see coming. I found myself, as Bridget was reading that Acts text, sort of laughing after a couple of days of rain, hearing, here is water. <laughs> what is to prevent me from being baptized? Some good puddles out there for that these days. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Hearing about God's love for you should be, though all too often isn't, an oft-repeated truth in the church, and certainly in this church. I hope that every single day you hear or know that you are loved. That's my best and highest hope for you. And God is love also ought to be an astonishing and breathtaking claim, especially so when we remember that it is just this love that is for you that knows no bounds that will never cease nor fade. And yet I wonder if the power of these words, God is love, isn't lost on us sometimes, perhaps at least in its familiarity. Over time we may become accustomed to hearing it and we just seem to lose how remarkable a claim it is. It also might lose some of its power for another reason, as Professor Jeanette Auk writes, the depth and power of the three words God is love are often lost on us because of the abundance of contradicting conceptions of love all around us. We tend to make gods out of love and equate all love with God. First John, however, speaks of love in a specific, distinctly Christian way. Love is not God, but God is love. Meaning that believers are to understand love on God's terms, according to God's character. Those who know God show God through their love for others. Divine love manifested most perfectly through the love of God in Christ is a reality that God desires us to know, see, inhabit, and share. <coughs> To say it again, the love of God only found in Jesus is a reality that God desires us to know, to see, to inhabit, and to share. Know, see, inhabit, and share, perhaps a guiding set of principles and practices for our lives in full recognition that being loved is not just an identity we embrace, but a demand placed on our lives. As beautiful as that first John reading is, I have to admit there is one part that were I afforded the chance I'd like to debate, and it's all found in these six words. No one has ever seen God. It seems to me that every single day, nearly innumerable chances are set before us to glimpse God, to see God at work in our world. And perhaps the entire point of the Christian life is to be witnesses to that same love too, that all who see and know us might know that God really is love through us, through us to the people who seek to be Jesus' disciples in the world. In this way, the one who became God among us is revealed. In this way, the image of God that each of us is created with, that each of us bears to the world is revealed. And the grace and good news of that is found just after the semicolon of that same line. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. We would be wise, though, to remember Professor Ock's words that I shared before, that we tend to make gods out of love and equate all love with God. Love is not God, but God is love. The kind of love we are talking about today is meant to be understood on God's terms. You see, the kind of love that God is is the kind of love that was willing to become one of us, to take on the hurt and heartbreak of this world that we might know <clears throat> of such love, the kind of love God is, became like one of us in order that we might see and know God among us, and more fully even now, the kind of love God is, made flesh in the person of Jesus, loved the world so much that it was this Jesus, this Son, who was sent to die. 
in order that the brokenness and sin and suffering of this world might not be like that forever, but might find a redemption and wholeness in life it would never otherwise know. To my mind, there are two things that sort of remain as deep challenges for living this kind of life, or two sort of ideas that I keep coming back to for following this kind of way, the way of Jesus that dwells in the truth that God is love, seeking to not make a God of any kind of love. The first comes from a reflection that I have shared with you more than once, because I think it's so true. Written by a priest in Memphis, Father Scott Walters, uh, to Calvary Church in Memphis, a blog post he, he wrote entitled, Love is a Bother. He wrote it after his dad had just died, and his dad, it seems, used to say no pressure when making an ask, even if that ask required the slightest bit of inconvenience. No pressure was how his dad said he didn't want to be a bother. Father Walters writes, nobody wants to be a bother. But what is love if not the bother we take with each other? It's sacrificing your Saturday for a nephew's dance recital or mowing a neighbor's lawn when she's out of town or baking a lasagna for your uncle when Aunt Lucy's in the hospital. Heck, we human beings will scale mountains and swim channels and make pilgrimages. We will learn to knit or play chess or rebuild carburetors or breathe daylilies for nothing more than love of the endeavor itself. Why do we think we need to keep the people who love us from bothering with us, whether in life or in death? Love is always a bother. Love is the bother. Father James Keenan, a Jesuit priest who once wrote about sin, pointed out that in the Gospels, Jesus, whenever he talks about sin, is rarely outright condemning someone for some, out, for some kind of massive act of violence, some horrible thing that we would call sin from the time that we were kids. These are never moments of outright injury or, or stealing or whatever it might be. But for Jesus, at least as he makes it known in the gospel, sin is a failure to bother to love. A failure to bother to love. It seems to me that if we are going to let the truth that God is love take hold in our hearts, it is essential that we remember this, that love is the bother. In so doing, we discover and remember that living out love that is God's is almost always directed at someone else first in care and love, taking a bother with them in order to know that they are known and seen in whatever life has set before them. The second thing that I wanted to share with you all today is this, and it's related. The difference in whether we let all kinds of love become God's in our lives or whether we let God's love transform our hearts is found when we are willing to take an honest, deep, soul-searching look at ourselves to see just who and what we have been willing to love. You see, to embrace that God is love requires that we set down all of the ways that we love only as we think that we should. It means that we have to let go of loving, using our own criteria for who and what deserves it and let God's, become, God's criteria become ours. But here's the thing, there is no such thing as criteria or measuring up for God's love. When we let our definition of love become a God, we realize that we all too often only love the things that we like, the people that we think deserve it, who and what we think should be loved. The kind of love that God is doesn't seek selfish gain or desire. It doesn't go after more or hold on tighter. It doesn't chase down power and fortune and fame. This is the kind of love that moves us across the chasms that divide us and turns enemy into someone with whom at least we can sit next to, or talk to, or perhaps even become friends. The kind of love God is became flesh in the person of Jesus who showed us that bothering to love looks like feeding the hungry when it seems impossible, caring for the sick and the scared, washing some feet, and laying down his own life that the world's brokenness might be redeemed. Perhaps we can only discover just how true and deep the claim that God is love is when we give our lives to following that way, that example, when we give our lives to bothering to love both ourselves and the world. And when we direct our love on ourselves 
towards other first, others first, then, then we will know its power. It is then that we discover just how true it is that God is love. It is then that we discover just how true God's love for you really is. I hope and pray that we all might be willing, might be brave enough, might be more imaginative, might be faithful enough to give more, our, more of ourselves to bother to love a little bit more deeply today and in this week to come and in every day. Let us not be worried about what it costs us. Let us not be caught up in what we may lose because the crazy, world-changing, paradoxical thing of this whole life of faith is that in so losing, we gain everything. In so giving, we discover more than we could ask for. In so serving, we find that we are served. In so being willing to give over ourselves to each other, we discover life beyond our wildest imaginations. To bother to love like this is to love as God has loved us and to proclaim with all that we do and are that God really is, God really is love. So let us know and see and inhabit and share this love and in so doing, discover even more fully God alive within us and giving life to the world. 